What are the strategic priorities for the Chief of Naval Research? How is ONR changing the way it does basic and applied research? I'll explore these questions and so much more with my very special guest, Rear Admiral Lauren Selby, Chief of Naval Research. So would you tell us more about the history and mission of the Office of Naval Research, ONR? Why is it so important to the success of the U.S. Navy and the Department of Defense now more than ever? Yeah, so Office of Naval Research was actually established uh, by uh, by an act of Congress uh, back in 1946. Public Law 588, signed by President Truman August 1st, 1946, established this office uh, to really focus on science and technology and how it will enable kind of future naval power. And, and just to be clear, I'm the Office of Naval research, not Navy research. And so by using the term naval, that means I support both the U.S. Navy and the United States Marine Corps. So it's both organizations in the Department of the Navy. I'm wondering, what are some of the key management challenges you face in your role and how have you sought to address some of those challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think I've hit some of that. So so some of this is this transition to technology. I, I have been saying for a while, and if you've been reading my stuff on you know, online or seeing my videos, I truly believe we are in some ways still fighting the last fight. And, and in this, what I'm talking about is kind of the Cold War model. I, I truly believe that the DOD is, is still, for the most part, organized kind of around that model. And while there's pockets of excellence trying to get us into this century, I, I think we're not, we're not going fast enough. And so that's, for me, the biggest challenge is how do I you know, disrupt our own system to look for new ways of doing business, uh, to try to attract new talent, different talent, to try to uh, you know convince people in the Pentagon that I can't wait until you know Palm 25 to start something that's going to change three times between today and fiscal year 25 if I don't start it right now, and and that's hard because the way we're organized, it's really organized around procuring large complex things like satellites and nuclear submarines and destroyers and high-end fighters and missiles. And we still need those things. So I'm very clear when I speak to people that I'm not suggesting we not do that, but I I think we need to have another host of systems and sensors that are actually a lot simpler. And maybe they're complicated, not complex. Uh, you know, that's, there's a nuance there. But but it's not complex. It's it's complicated. And as a result, maybe they're even less expensive. And, and maybe they don't have as much range or endurance, but still they have a purpose and a function. And so I've been talking about this for a couple of years now, and it's really starting to resonate with people. And, you know, Chris Bros and I have had some great conversations. You know, he's he's a believer in this kind of future, more agile kind of uh, warfare uh, he wrote that book, The Kill Chain, a couple of years ago, which, uh, which he and I have had some great discussions about. So it is starting to catch on in pockets. And I, I think the biggest thing I'm most proud of in this job is I think I've actually allowed a host of younger and middle tier people, civilian and military, to actually kind of ask questions and, and question the way we're doing business in a respectful manner. But they're actually questioning and, and they're coming up with new ideas. And you can see the excitement, you know, when you go into a group of these folks and you talk about these, you know, advanced concepts, they get it. And, and I'm not suggesting my, my peers don't get it. They do get it. But they're also kind of, they've been in the system long enough and they've been doing things the same way long enough that that's kind of what they do. And oh, by the way, we still got to do that stuff because we're still building those complex things. It's how do you allocate enough time in your day to also focus on these other things which I think are tremendously impactful. And so that is one of the biggest challenges is how do you change the system or develop maybe a, a parallel system that does these alternate kind of what, what I call the small, the agile, and the many type things, while you also have another system, which is really the DOD 5000 and the acquisition system we have today that does the, the complex things. Let that system keep doing that. Arguably, it does it pretty well. I mean, yeah, you can knit, knit out of here and there, but at the end of the day, you get a really capable Virginia class submarine or joint strike fighter or, you know, uh, Arleigh Burke destroyer. It does that pretty well. So let that system do that. We need something else for these other things that I'm talking about. Things that are much more digitally based, software based systems and sensors. We need a, we need a different model to go do that. And, and that's part of my scout campaign 
you know, I'm, I'm scouting for new ways of doing business, scouting for new approaches to experimentation, scouting for new approaches to solving problems. You know, that's another thing I talk about a lot. We are so focused on requirements, which again, takes a year or longer to develop a requirement. You then have to budget for it. Then you have to go you know, procure whatever you've got the requirement for. Again, big billion dollar things, that's a good process. You still want that requirements process. For most of these other things I'm talking about, we need, we need to become problem focused. What's the problem we're trying to solve and then go seek solutions, many of which are potentially commercially available. And, and I don't even need to go design or build. I just go buy it and provide it to the warfighters. Hell, maybe I don't even buy it. Maybe I just contract for it, contract for the service. Put that sensor in this block of the ocean and give me data. I'll pay you day for day. I mean, it's that kind of model. So I'm trying to really tilt it the way we do business to open different pathways for solving problems that the warfighters have right now that can be solved much more quickly than developing a requirement, putting it in your POM25 request, and then going through all the long stroke of things you do in the traditional acquisition process. This has got to be something different. And that's that's what I'm trying to do. You know, sir, as the chief of naval research, you are responsible, as I say, for reimagining naval power for the future in all domains from the ocean floor to space. And where I'm going with this is I'd love for you to outline your strategic vision uh, for your organization and the enterprise. And perhaps you could highlight some of your key priorities that make this vision that you outlined before a reality. Yeah. So again, it, it, it all starts with people. And so one of the foundations for my, you know, my strategy and my vision is to make sure that I've basically built a, a highly effective team of dedicated professionals to, uh, uh, to do science and technology. Um, and in my mind, it starts in kindergarten. And so again, the STEM, my, my hat as the Naval STEM executive is critical to that, where I, uh, I've got a team of folks here at, at O&R, in the, at this O&R headquarters that, that lead that, but then they work with the rest of the entire Navy and Marine Corps team to have STEM presence uh, at high schools and middle schools and, you know, uh, science fairs and robotics competitions across the country, sometimes even other parts of the world to get kids excited about science. Usually kids are actually pretty excited about science, elementary school, but really to keep them excited about science, to mentor them and to pull them across. There's, there's a value of death for kids in STEM too. And it's middle school. I, at least that's my personal experience. It's, it's like they grow up inquisitive and love science. think it's really cool. So we're middle school. It, it either it's unbe- done become cool or oftentimes a kid may not see someone that looks like them. That's more senior or older doing something that they think is cool and fun. And as a result, they kind of lose interest. So anyway, so that value depth exists there too. And so we, I want to try to find ways to, you know, minimize the kids you lose because of that. You may lose them because they truly love music or, or art and that's fine. But if you lose a kid because they don't see someone who looks like them, them that's, that's, that's wrong. We need to diversify our workforce. So anyway, so it starts with STEM. So foundational is people, get them in, uh, track them, and then give them meaningful work. Uh, and, and again, just kind of step back, stay out of their way, let them do their jobs. Uh, present them with very unique challenges, uh, but also with the equipment, the facilities, uh, the resources they need to do their, their, their mission, their science, their, their engineering, whatever it is they do, give them what they need to do that. Connect them with the true warfighters. So allow the scientists to travel to the waterfront to meet a Marine, meet a sailor, allow the Marine, the sailor to come to the laboratory to, to meet the scientists and, and try to facilitate that. So people are exchanging ideas and, and for a scientist or engineer at a laboratory or warfare center to know a sailor or a Marine because they've been to that base, been on that ship, been on that submarine, see not just the sailor, but also the equipment that that scientist or engineer maybe cares about and then see it in the context of how it operates. That can really keep people working for us forever. You, you find people get into this organization and uh, I, I was giving out some longevity awards recently. I think there was a 50 year award I just gave out to somebody. So you get people to come here and they just, they love that connection to the sailor and, and the fleet and that sense of purpose that they garner. So part of my vision is to kind of establish that environment where people, they love what they do. They feel connected to the end user and the technology and the equipment they have to operate with is world class. Admiral, as a follow-up to that strategic vision you just laid out, why is it smart to develop a strategic hedge? And how do specific internal drivers and external trends shape and inform that hedge? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you you can look throughout history, different examples of where technology is kind of moved ahead like it does. But um, 
the organization has has lagged behind it. And again, this is common. This is this is this is the way humans are. You get kind of set in your ways of of, of whatever your daily life is like and the technology you have and then new things are presented to you and there's always going to be a couple of early adopters and there's going to be most of us in the middle of that bell curve who, who kind of take it at a, at a later date after it's kind of been proven and then there's gonna be some laggards who just kind of never get it and they just kind of dismiss the whole thing and and they're kind of the dinosaurs just to be frank um so i think we're kind of at that pivotal moment again in history where technology has raced pretty far ahead of of uh, the organizations that in my case, uh, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the, the DOD, uh, and, and many other companies and corporations and, and departments across the government. It's not just DOD, but the technology has gotten pretty far ahead and we're kind of struggling to catch up. And if you look back to the 20th century and you just think about the period between World War One and World War II, technology was advancing and uh, you know, these aviators were becoming a, a real kind of a, had a real relevance to warfare as well as the transportation, but warfare is the, the point we're going to talk about here. And uh, there was another cadre of these aviators that thought, hey, I wonder if we could operate off ships. And um, they convinced enough people in the Navy to actually fund some experimentation and some, and some flat tops, some aircraft carriers. And fortunately we were able to kind of develop a cadre of people who understood how to fly airplanes off of ships and how to employ them in warfare because there was a whole nother cadre of folks. And it was the majority of folks that basically said, Hey, the battleships have been doing us a great service since the turn of the century. And uh, we're going to keep these things around because they're going to be the future of warfare. And we're going to just keep using these things. And if we have a, a conflict, then the battleships are going to go over there and, you know, sink, sink the enemy. And that'll be the end of the war. Now we all know what happened, uh, you know, in World War II and December 7th in particular. And fortunately, uh, we had a backup plan. We had a hedge strategy. And that's kind of what this, the hedge strategy, it's just like investing. You may have a primary asset that you, you put a lot of your money in, but you also want to hedge that because what if that primary asset takes a hit in the stock market? You want to have a, another strategy that's got some, maybe some other types of investments that will weather that storm as it were. Same thing here. We need to have a hedge. So I think today, I think you look around the Navy um, and Marine Corps and the hedge strategy is really based upon these complex things I talked about. You know, again, high-end fighters, submarines, aircraft carriers, destroyers, satellites. And I, I just think we need, we need a backup plan because I think like everything in life, um, you know, there's, there's a point where that technology or capability is at its peak. And there's a point where you move past that and something else takes its place. And again, I am not suggesting that's going to happen tomorrow, but I think it's within kind of sight this century that that transition will happen just like it did in the last century. And we need to be ready for that, which means we need to start trying things, experimenting with new concepts and technologies, and over time, making them more and more a part of your mainstream operations. And if something were to happen one day and we take a hit, uh, we'll have a backup plan. We'll have some other ways of also responding. That's the long way of talking about the head strategy. That's what that is. Excellent perspective. I want to switch gears a bit. And, and get to the idea you've mentioned, you know, um, data is the new oil and software is the new steel in this environment. So I was wondering, how has the advan advent of digital systems fundamentally changed the design capabilities and principles on which organizations must operate to be successful in a di digital platform? And more specifically for the, for the na naval research, how has it transformed from a requirements checklist type mindset to one that seeks to solve problems? Yeah, yeah. So, so if you think about kind of the the world that uh, we used to live in, where literally you were developing blueprints, and you were having to take a blueprint and then by hand basically transcribe from the blueprint to another document that got translated down to the shop floor, where a machinist was then on a lathe, maybe or in a drill press, maybe manufacturing components to make the end device that that blueprint is is calling for you to build okay and that's the way we did it for thousands of years i mean i mean that's the way we did things and uh, and that all fundamentally has changed over the last 25 30 years maybe 40 years you know since the 80s somewhere in that it started changing now the change was slow and it and in some pockets it's still it's still slow but in other pockets it is just totally transforming the world 
you're starting to see um, in particular the commercial aviation space and now in the military avi aviation space, we're able to design the entire platform in a digital three-dimensional kind of tool set and then also port that design into models to simulate its performance under different environmental conditions. So that is clearly where you need to be if you want to stay agile and you want to change the design, see what the design change does to performance, to acoustic properties, to hydrodynamics, to whatever. That can all be done now. The problem we have today is that there are different pockets that do this better than others. So when it comes to like the three-dimensional design tool, the CAD CAM kind of things that we used to talk about in college, those tools are actually pretty mature. And, and most organizations are using those tools, but there's a point where you, you get done with that initial design that you now have to go to, uh, maybe, maybe you have to compete the design and pick a vendor to go build the, the thing, whatever the thing is. Well, there's a, there's a break there between, you know, maybe I'm using one tool set in my design shop and it's a different tool set in a, in a manufacturing environment. So you now got to figure out how do I translate this product into that new environment? That can take a, some degree of fat fingering or some degree of rendering or changes to the, to the model to make that fit properly. Uh, and then furthermore, when you, when you finish manufacturing it, you now go into the test and evaluation environment. Well, some of that TNA I want to do in modeling and sim, some I want to do for real. Those breaks are also uh, not very clean. And then finally, when you get done with delivering the system, the ship, the platform, the weapon, whatever it is, you now have a, a many years of keeping that thing in service and doing maintenance and maintaining it. Yet another set of tools might be involved. And another set of vendors might be involved in those tools. And so we've not yet completed what I call the digital thread. So that thread that goes from initial concept refinement, you know, back of the envelope, back of the napkin kind of design things we used to think, talk about when the, the aha moment occurred when you were, you know, sitting in a restaurant with a friend and you all of a sudden have to scribble on a piece of paper this concept or this picture of what you think this thing could be um, to the point of actually delivering and maintaining that device. That is a complete, that needs to be a complete digital thread. And we got to figure out how we do that. How do you handle the fact that you are going to have different vendors, different contractors, you're going to have different tools. We've got to build this more continuous process so you can really have that total agility throughout the life of that platform. And again, you're starting to see this come together. Uh, it's a little kludgy still. And this is where you need organizations like uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards, to help us drive those standards across the whole of government, whole of industry to drive that commonality. And so that's starting to happen. Um, and I think once that kind of uh, gets in lockstep, as it were, it's going to be amazing how fast we can actually go with some of these designs and change the designs. There, there may still be a penalty for the manufacturer, particularly if it's like a large complex thing where you have to put a ship in dry dock or you've got to bring a plane into a hangar and take it apart. There's going to be some time penalty for that, but it'll still be far faster than it is today. So that's kind of what these digital tools for you. Then you bring in things like advanced manufacturing, digital twins, where you're able to monitor how tool or the device to the generator should operate in a perfect environment compared to how it's operating in real life and look for the divergence and the differences and then go find out why there's differences from the, you know, the perfect environment to the the current environment and then react accordingly. Maybe you got to do some kind of maintenance. Maybe you got to replace something. Maybe you just have to alter the, you know, the fuel, fuel to air mixture. I mean, it can be all kinds of things, but that, that digital twinning gives you those kind of capabilities as well. So it is transforming the world and it's incredibly exciting. I think we're still kind of watching this, this wave is kind of, we're still, still kind of on it. We're not, we haven't gotten through the wave yet, but it's exciting, tremendously impactful, and it's going to change every aspect of our, our lives. This has been the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with Rear Admiral Lauren Selby, Chief of Naval Research. Be sure to join us next time for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government leadership and its effectiveness. Until then, subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at Podcast One, iTunes, or on your favorite podcast app, and as always at businessofgovernment.org.